more, folks. Um, we are here not to give you an opinion of, of what, you know, what it is you need to do. We're just going to give you, uh, just based on lessons learned and, and what I've learned over the last several years about what it takes to uh, set up armed security teams for a church. All right, this is based on uh, best practices and lessons learned, not just from doing this for churches and private Christian schools, but for doing this in the private or the uh, private and uh, public sector, uh, nuclear, chemical security, and other programs where I've developed. So just that template. All right, so you guys decide how you want to do it. We're just going to give you some best practices. Uh, we're going to talk about risk. We're going to talk about basic considerations. We're going to talk about prepaid legal services. Um, after we talk about that, uh, before Q&A, what's going to happen is a nice young lady is going to come up. She's going to give you some information about pre uh, prepaid legal, very specifically about the church and how that works. Um, take notes. So here's why. At the end of this, we're going to do a Q&A where you're going to type in information or questions. Scott's going to read those to me so I can answer those questions. So here's how you do that. If you've logged into your Google Chrome or Safari before, there'll be instructions. You should know how to do that. If you do not know, then you can go to Facebook because we're streaming live on Facebook. And you can answer, uh, ask those questions through Facebook Live. And through that, Scott will give me those at the Q&A. So real quick, again, we're going to talk about risk, basic consideration. We're going to get into prepaid legal. Someone's going to talk to you, uh, and then you can ask the questions after this. All right? Okay, so let's get started again. Uh, take notes because you're going to have questions, and I don't want you to forget those questions. We want to answer whatever questions you just happen to have, so take notes as we go through the presentation. So let's talk about if you're a church and you don't have an armed security team, what that means you want to implement this. So first, just some things to think about. All right, you guys have heard uh, this from me before. Guns do not protect or prevent violence at churches. Okay, so if you're a pastoral, you're a pastor, pastoral leader, you lead a church, or you're going to be leading a security team. Guns do not prevent violence in churches, and they don't protect churches. All right, physical protection systems protect churches or those functions. You've heard this from me before. That's deterrence, detection, delay, and response. Response or the guns are a tool of response. That is always the last function in physical security or physical protection. Protection is all about prevention. So as you go through this process of implementing a team or an armed team, think about a preventative strategy first, not the responsive strategy. Response only mitigates and only sets you up for recovery once or after that shooting or that violent event occurs. So, uh, and the most successful programs, obviously when we talk about physical protection, deterrence and early detection of adversary activity are what prevents violence. All right? So just remember, when you start talking about, hey, I, I, want, a, I want a church security team and everybody has to be armed, guns do not prevent violence. That's all going to be prevention, preventative strategies. You, girt, you guys have heard that from me before. Okay? Understand this too, especially pastors, if you're looking at this, or church leaders, understand that there is a low probability of an armed attack occurring at your church. Very, very low probability. What that means is the risk level, the likelihood, more than likely it's not going to happen. Do we have church attacks? I, I, absolutely we have them, but that's a low probability of that occurring. This is one of the threats that's probably going to be minimal at best. So think about this, more than 350,000 Protestant churches in the United States of America. In the last uh, 19 years, there have been 14 attacks at churches. Okay. Your goal is to reduce that vulnerability to attack, and you're going to do that through prevention, not through the use of guns, if that makes sense. All right? Again, you've probably got a bunch of questions. Write those down so you can ask those questions later on. Okay? So let's talk about uh, armed volunteers. Understand, not only, again, is this a very, uh, when we talk about risk, it's very minimal and low probability. Something else, the next uh, consideration in this is armed volunteers may increase your risk at your church to both uh, the things you guys are worried about are civil liability, okay? So understand if you have an armed element at your church, what that means is that it can increase the risk of an undesirable event at your location. Uh, give us some background here. This is a, uh, uh, or it was, a church security team. This happened about a month, month and a half ago, maybe less, up in Lancaster uh, County, Pennsylvania. There was a... Uh, there was a armed security team uh, that uh, was in place. They have some sort of a location. 
um, where uh, they have like a, a, a meeting place. Inside that location, uh, the security team, I don't know if they were coming off duty or what they were doing, uh, but at some point, uh, one of the security team members drew a pistol. Uh, they presented their pistol, and there was a negligent discharge, okay? And so let's uh, watch uh, the video here to see what happened. A large church like this has dozens of ministries, including a security team that has dozens of members. Can I hear that? One man on that team was injured when another security guard's gun accidentally mm. went off during services Sunday morning. There was no need to evacuate the building because it was contained to a, you know, a specific room within the church building itself. Police say five members of the security team were in the office when the handgun discharged. The fired round ricocheted off the ground. Either bullet fragments or pieces of the floor wounded the other security guard. It is unfortunate that this type of incident occurred, and again, it was unintentional. Police say the church and security team members are cooperating in the ongoing investigation, but police are not yet releasing the names of those team members and will not say if charges could be pending in this case. In Lancaster County, I'm Meredith Jorgensen, WGAL News 8. Okay. All right. So, was I able to hear that? Okay. So, uh, that was the situation. So, an armed volunteer has a negligent discharge. Two people are injured. Okay. So, when we start to talk about the increased risk, now let's talk about what happened. So, the, in the incident occurs. Some folks are injured. Those folks are medically treated. Uh, luckily, there weren't any fatalities. And now, a couple of weeks, or, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks later, the increased risk issue comes up, okay? Security guards comparing their guns' trigger pulls led to a shot being fired in a church, and now charges have just been filed against one of them. The shot was fired last month at the worship center on New Holland Pike in Lancaster County. Security guard William Mays is charged with simple assault and reckless endangerment. Police say Mays unintentionally fired a bullet from his gun while exchanging guns with another guard in a church office. Two of the five security guards in the office were hit by bullet fragments. Okay, hold on. Okay, so when we start to talk about liability and what that means, the increase of risk, so that security person or that uh, member of that security team uh, was obviously was charged um, uh, criminally uh, because of the incident, so because of negligence. So uh, security team members get together for whatever reason, a weapon comes out, uh, there's a negligent discharge, people are hurt, and because of that negligence, that security team member uh, was obviously charged with a criminal offense. There also could be uh, some sort of a civil charge or civil offense because of that. So you've got criminal liability and then you have civil liability and of course that could fall on the church and that could fall on the individual. So not only uh, the criminal and civil liability but think of the social impact or that social risk that it also has to the church if you have an incident like this occur. Okay. So another consideration to think about when we start to talk about um, armed security teams at churches is insurance rates may increase. Okay, so think about this. Uh, there are risk mitigation strategies, and when we use insurance to, to actually reduce risk, that is a risk transfer. And what that means is we're taking the risk that we had and we're transferring that to some other entity. And so the insurance company itself, because that's what you're going to pay for, because if there's an issue, then obviously if, you, you know, if, if you're covered, then the insurance company is going to pay out for that. And so think about this. As you transfer that risk, there's things that the insurance company is going to need. And first is they're going to want information on what you're doing. So they're going to send out a questionnaire. And in that questionnaire, as you start to talk to your insurance company, they're going to want uh, specific policies and procedures. Now, I just finished a comprehensive uh, uh, policy for a private Christian school that's going to have a proprietary security program that will be armed. I've done this for a number of churches. If you want the answers or you want those questions, 
that we normally get, uh, send us an email, Scott M S E O T T M at michaelmansecurityservice.com. We'll send you that list, so that way you've got the list of questions or expectations that your insurance company may ask or they may ask you to provide to them, so you've got to jump on it. And most of the time, it's pretty detailed if you're going to tell them you're going to be deploying uh, very specifically armed volunteers. All right? So uh, they're going to ask uh, a number of questions. Most of the time, churches are not prepared to answer those questions because those uh, policies and procedures that the insurance company is going to look for uh, a lot of times are not in place. So just again, think about it. Your insurance rates may increase, and there's going to be specific questions that you're going to be asked. Okay? All right. So if you have questions, again, let me go through those real quick. Insurance rates are going to go up, or possibly. You're going to increase your risk to the church. Okay? Uh, and just always remember, low probability of an armed attack. And when we start to talk about prevention, prevention uh, or when we start to talk about, talk about pro protection itself, guns do not prevent violence. They are nothing but an element or a tool of response. Okay? So let's talk about some things. This is the process. This is the step. What it is that you go through are the steps that you'll go through to implement an armed team. And remember, I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just advising you the templates I've used to design armed security programs for nuclear sites, chemical sites, churches, private Christian schools, corporate centers. This is what I've used, and this saved me a lot of time after I developed this. So number one, as a church, so if you're the church security team leader or the manager, and you're looking at an armed security team, the very first thing you need to do is obtain permission from that church leadership. So explore the use of armed security volunteers as you go through that process. Share that and get permission from the church first. Um, permission versus forgiveness. I've talked to churches where they deploy armed folks and people in their leadership don't know that. The security team has been approved, but where the church ne doesn't necessarily know, the leadership doesn't know that there are armed folks there volunteering. Be aware if you don't let the leadership know then they may not communicate that or they won't communicate to the insurance company. And what that, means if the, uh, what that means is if there is some sort of undesirable event like a shooting or even something that happened like in Pennsylvania where there's a negligent discharge uh, and there's, uh, there's criminal liability there, the insurance company is not going to, they're not going to cover you for that. So get permission from the church first before you start to look at the use of armed security volunteers. Because again, this increases the risk for the church. And so, uh, ultimately, they own this risk, okay? The next thing is once you get permission to start going through this process, you're going to want to take information back to the church to get them to approve it. So the, the next thing you're going to do is I would gather data. I would conduct an assessment. And what that means is you're going to look for threats. What has happened at the church or in churches throughout the country that would drive you to want to have an armed security team because if leadership's concerned about risk, which most of them are, they're going to ask you, well, why do we need armed people? Everybody doesn't have armed people. I've got friends at pastor churches and other places. They don't have armed security teams. Why do they need that? So look at your intentional threats, your unintentional threats, and, of course, those things that protect the church from embarrassment. Those are all those things that you're trying to protect the church from. And so go through the process of the last year, two years, and try to figure out what has happened, okay? Um, resources. The next thing I want to know is what is this going to cost? What does it mean for us to do this, and do we have the resource to do it? If you don't have a budget, that means some of this cost may fall on the individual volunteer. Well, what's that going to cost that volunteer, and are those volunteers willing to do that? So gather that information up in an assessment collect that data, and then you're going to report that back to the church. Regulatory requirements. So the next thing after you've started that you've done your assessment on threats, you've done your assessment on resources, go back and identify what the regulatory requirements are going to be for your folks to actually volunteer as armed security team members. What does that mean? And so um, there is, uh, here in the state of Tennessee, if you're in Tennessee, the only thing you have to have to volunteer to church is a carry permit. And now there are a couple of different carry permits here in the state. Uh, but what does that mean? You know, can they carry open? Can they carry concealed? Where is the law? Who can tell me that? Um, do, and, you know, some states require an armed guard license before they would allow even a volunteer to serve uh, armed on a church security team. So what does that mean? 
insurance. What does it mean from an insurance perspective? Um, what kind of insurance coverage do, does the church have to have to be able to have armed volunteers? We've talked about that before. And what about the volunteer? What about the individual that's standing post? What does that mean for them? So what are the uh, regulatory requirements for you to have an armed volunteer team uh, on your site? Go back and figure that out. Because, again, the church, when you go back with this data, they're going to need to know that. All right? The next is very quickly develop a standard, okay? So a regulatory requirement and a standard are two different things. So the regulatory requirement is what the state says you have to have before you can have an armed volunteer security team member standing post. A standard is going to be based on the mission uh, of a group of armed volunteers and citizens. It is a rule of measure that all team members should follow, okay? Um, so this is something that they're going to have to do based on something that you guys design or your team designs, all right? Um, if you're looking at using guns on campus, so if you have armed volunteers on campus, I would consider, if you're going to consider handguns, you need to consider the use of intermediate weapons also. More than likely, if your team ever has to use force, it's probably not going to be the use of deadly force. It's going to be some other use of force. And so if the only tool that they have is a handgun, a lot of times that's not something that they're going to be able to use. So think about and consider uh, other options for the use of force if you're going to put handguns in place. All right? So again, develop a standard. The difference between that and a regulatory requirement, regulatory requirement is just something, the basics that the state's going to require you to do before you can have an armed person on site volunteering. A standard is a, is a rule of measure that all team members have to follow based on your security program. Now, this is a difference between a regulatory requirement and a standard or why this is important. So uh, this happened um, back several years ago in Utah. I was actually in Utah when this happened. So I was designing a physical protection program for a chemical site. So under 6 CFR Part 27, the Department of Homeland Security uh, a rule under the Code of Federal Regulations, I was in Utah for about a year um, designing a security program for a chemical site, an armed program to protect these uh, chemicals. So while I was there, I was leaving the plant one day after working and getting this program into place. Uh, I'm listening to the radio, and this happened. So this was a teacher in the state of Utah. So uh, I don't know what the requirements are now, but then when this happened, uh, in the state of Utah, if you're a teacher and you have a handgun carry permit, you have the ability to carry concealed in school or in a public school as a teacher. And so what happened was a, uh, a teacher at a public school, I believe it was an elementary school, uh, goes into a restroom, goes into a stall, shuts the stall. For whatever reason, reason uh, that teacher this young lady uh, takes the handgun out of the carry system uh, that she was deploying so I don't know if it was a holster I don't know if it was a belly band I don't know what it was um, at some point uh, there was a negligent discharge and the projectile uh, hit the porcelain of the toilet bowl and that uh, porcelain came back and it cut her leg at first she believed that she was shot obviously everybody in the school heard the gunshot they put the school on lockdown they called 911 the police had to come out uh, and there was all this, uh, this uh, social risk that was involved with the school. While I was there uh, on the radio, there were all these talk shows, and people were talking about this incident. And several parents came on TV and, you know, on the, I'm sorry, on the radio on these programs, and they started to uh, talk about that the state maybe should rethink having teachers armed in schools because of this negligence. So even though there was a regulatory requirement in place, maybe the standard was not what it should have been. If it, maybe if it was different, this would not have happened. So here's the story real quick so you can watch it. An elementary school teacher outside of Salt Lake City was shot when her own gun discharged at the school. Officials in Taylorsville, Utah say 6th grade teacher Michelle Ferguson Montgomery was in a faculty bathroom when her gun fired and shattered a toilet. She was struck in the leg and the, my understanding is that the bullet actually exited the leg as well. The school district says the teacher was absolutely acting within the law. This teacher uh, has a concealed weapon is a concealed weapon permit holder and under state law is able to bring this weapon onto campus. Parents expressed mixed feelings about a teacher having a gun on campus. It doesn't bother me one bit. I think with all the school shootings that have happened, I think more teachers should carry to be able to protect our, st protect our kids. If you have an AR-15 and as many rounds as you want, are you really going to be discouraged when you're on a suicidal rampage of uh, 
50 year old woman with 30 kids carrying a concealed pistol? I doubt it. No other faculty or students were wounded. Authorities are investigating how the gun discharged. Robert Bumstead, Associated Press. So when we uh, go back to this, uh, when we start to talk about a regulatory requirement, so now let's talk about another example. This happened at a faith-based organization. So this was a synagogue, actually, in California, just uh, just around Los Angeles. And so this is a situation where um, uh, a synagogue uh, has a school uh, attached to it, a Jewish school. And during the day, as the students were transitioning from one class to another, what ends up happening um, is someone, uh, a YouTuber, comes on site to, for whatever reason, to video this transition. Uh, the Jewish school has an armed, uniformed armed security officer on site. The, um, the armed security officer sees this person, this YouTuber, videoing this transition. There is some sort of an altercation, verbal altercation, between the guard and this YouTuber. Uh, and then somehow there is a discharge of a firearm and the YouTuber is injured. So uh, I'll let you see this. Again, there's a regulatory requirement for, uh, obviously, for armed guards in the state of California. Uh, but this gets into the difference between what's the regulatory requirement and really what should a standard for your church or faith-based organization look like. And the point of this is it probably needs to be at a higher level. Shot me. This was the startling moment a YouTuber whose channel name is Furry Potato was shot in the leg. Ah, oh, oh, shot me. The whole thing was streamed live on the account. Police say the content curator, who goes by Zoe Perez, was outside a Los Angeles synagogue standing on a public sidewalk when she was shot by a security guard. During the incident, we did try to keep the girls calm and the building was placed on lockdown. The school's principal says there was concern over what Zoe was filming. An individual was filming our girls at the school and the building, the perimeter of the building extensively, including all the windows and the exits. And this caused a great deal of anxiety to both our staff and our students. You know, I'm just taking shots of the thing. You know, he comes up super aggressive. I'm not looking to talk to that guy at that point. Some say the school's response was uncalled for. Listen, nobody should freak out when someone's recording from a public sidewalk. And that's all she was doing. Perez is a First Amendment auditor, according to the YouTube channel description. The account with me. And I don't understand how I could interfere with business when I was in the lobby for 25 seconds, but you know, it is what it is. Perez, who here is commenting on previous unrelated charges, isn't facing charges in this case. The security guard was charged with assault using a deadly weapon. This is InsideEdition.com. All right. So again, uh, so what ended up happening with the security officer, the security guard? So uh, some background on why they have to have armed security. So back in 1999, uh, a, a white supremacist came down to Los Angeles, California, attempted to, uh, was going to attack a couple of Jewish schools. As he kind of went through the Los Angeles area, he noticed that they had security. Uh, he believed he was psychologically impacted or his motivation to attack those schools was impacted. And so he ended up attacking a community center that had a preschool. So after that attack and after, those, uh, after that event occurred and they got the information about that event, uh, a lot of the Jewish schools, or the majority of the Jewish schools in Los Angeles, or in that in that county, have armed security guards. And so this guard's there. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe it was a. Uh, if if you look at this, uh, more than likely, what I believe is that uh, the guard probably drew the the firearm. Finger uh, got on the trigger. There was a negligent discharge, so it was a negligent discharge uh, of the firearm itself, and it injured that YouTuber. The uh, security officer was charged. License was suspended, but the charges were later dismissed in court. So, uh, than what that requirement is. All right. The other, uh, another consideration: the use of prepaid legal services. And here's why. So when we start talking about armed team members, uh, if a situation like what happened, uh, uh, you know, at the synagogue where uh, there is a, a use of force that's improper or you have to use force and that force is deemed necessary, um, there still could be some sort of civil uh, litigation against the church uh, and or against the team member after that's done, even if it's justified. So because of that, 
prepaid legal services, individual prepaid legal services for your team members should be talked about. It should be discussed, okay? We're going to bring somebody up here in just a few minutes. They can talk to you about that and give you more information about it. That assists your volunteers with transferring additional risk to this prepaid legal services. That's why you have it, okay? And again, what you want to look for, even in prepaid legal services, is not just a service that's going to cover handguns, but also covers intermediate weapons if your team is actually deploying intermediate <coughs> weapons like we suggested. Okay. Another consideration now, after you get all this together, now this is helping you form your program. You take, uh, you take this program. Now this is, again, because you have standards, you're meeting regulatory requirements, you're, you're starting to look at insurance requirements. Uh, you start to look at what the cost of that is. You look at your resources. Now you take that package and you go back to your church leadership. Now, instead of having just a group of individuals that are armed, you actually have a package, uh, a, a program that's packaged and ready for the church to either uh, accept or to deny or reject it. It's going to be up to the leadership. So now what you've got is you've got something to present to them that's well thought that what's well thought out. It's presented and it gives them all the facts and all the information that they need to move forward. Okay, so take that and now present that back to leadership. Okay, all right. Uh, very very quick steps. Uh, again, sorry about the technical difficulties. Now, uh, uh, one of the steps we talked about was the use of prepaid legal services for your armed volunteers. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to have a very uh, nice lady uh, step up here, and she's going to talk to you about that. And again, if you have questions about that, please uh, submit those questions in uh, uh, to whether you're on Google Chrome or Safari or Facebook. And at the end of this presentation, we will answer those questions. All right. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Juliana, and I'm with the United States Concealed Carry Association. So you've gotten a lot of information from Michael already on protecting your church, protecting yourself, and some of the things that happen in that process and even after. What I want to talk to you really quickly about is what does happen after that event. So at the USCCA, what we do is we provide all of our members with three things. Number one is education. Number nobody, two is training, it's just, it's and then number three is legal protection. So it's all of our members worse. are provided with a legal protection, like a prepaid legal, but it's all-inclusive. So I'll give you what our all-inclusive covers here in just a moment. Now, we know it's extremely important to have the education and the training. As Michael showed you here, there are lots of different incidents that we could possibly run into that could happen to us, not only at church, but in our home or while we're out in the public as well. So if we don't find a way that we can get out of an attack and prevent something from happening, then the next step would be response. We want to give you all of the tools that you need to be able to respond if you have to, to an event to protect yourself and those that you love. So with your USCCA membership, you are going to get a wide variety of information in your member portal that's going to teach you how to build home defense plans. It's going to teach you some scenario-based training on what to do to prevent an attack and respond if necessary. And then we give you a lot of gun laws, reciprocity maps, and things to keep you as a responsibly armed American. Now, what I also want to mention is the USCCA isn't just guns. We don't just protect those that carry handguns. We protect everyone that was born to protect. So with that, your USCCA membership is going to cover you in any act of self-defense all over the nation in all 50 states with any legal weapon that you use. So for our membership with the legal protection, what happens when you become a member with us is you get a member card. And on this member card, it's going to give you direct access to it if you're involved in any type of incident. So we know there's two sides of the legal system. Michael's hit briefly on that. We've got the criminal side. The criminal is where we're fighting for our freedom. And then the civil is where we're fighting for our money. So with your USCCA membership, we're going to provide everything following that incident to keep you protected under both of those. For instance, in a criminal situation, we know how important it is to have a good attorney. Your membership is going to cover an attorney for you in all 50 states. We have over 1,100 in our network, or you can choose any attorney that you want to from all across the nation. 
Once you have that attorney, we're going to provide bail expert witnesses, ballistics experts, anything that you would need while you were in trial and fighting a self-defense charge. Once all charges are dropped and dismissed, because that's the ultimate goal, we know we acted right. We stood up to protect ourselves and our loved ones. As Michael mentioned, the civil side happens next. So we do face a lot of civil liability in any act as well. With your membership, we're going to provide your attorney as well as civil damages. We know attorneys are very costly, so having one is super important. But oftentimes, damages are awarded regardless of the situation. So we want you to be protected, and that's why with your membership, we cover those civil damages as well. So I want to ask you to become a part of our family and be the protector of yourself, your loved ones, and your church security team. The education and training is proven to be the number one thing we need to focus on to prevent an attack or possibly survive one. So we want to give you those tools and resources through your member portal so that you can then be prepared and be ready to act if necessary. Following that incident, we have your back. We want to protect you while you go through the entire process. It's going to be a long one, but we don't want you to feel alone. So you can go to the link that will be down in the comments to sign up for your USCCA membership. If you have any questions at all, send it in the comments. Ask the question. I'll make sure I get answers. My name's Maria Juliana. You can contact me directly if you'd like more information on the USCCA. Or you can also contact Michael, and we'll make sure we get answers if we don't already have them. Thank you. All right, folks, we are going to go. If you have questions, you can shoot those to us now. We'll answer those in just a minute, whether it's about prepaid legal or whether that's about what you saw today. Hey, we're, uh, we're recording this, and so we're going to go through do some edits. We're going to post this on the uh, Michael Mann Security Services Facebook page. Sorry about all the technical difficulties we had this morning. And so you'll be able to see this again. If you have questions, if you watch this again later or you're watching this again at a later point, email us at Scott M, S C O T T M, uh, at MichaelMansSecurityServices.com and uh, we will answer those questions for you. Okay? Any questions, Scott? We have anything? Okay? All right. So uh, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, we hope everybody's staying safe. Uh, we hope this mess that's happening uh, right now uh, passes very soon. Everybody gets back to work. Um, but like everything else, it will pass. We'll get back to normal. Um, we hope you uh, learned something out of today. Again, if you've got some questions, shoot us an email. Uh, you can get us again at scottm, S-C-O-T-T-M, at michaelmansecurityservices.com, or you can email us through Facebook at Safe with Man. Uh, and remember, folks, it's about prevention, not response. All right.